Hello everybody and welcome back on B4 Basketball for your Tripid podcast and today you will have the chance to hear more about uh, Frederic Ajiwano's story and he'll talk about uh, his experience with the Spurs in the Summer League and also his comeback uh, in France to pursue and end uh, his professional career. Did the, the Spurs at any, any point of this, uh, this month with the Summer League, did they like offer you something, just promises about the contract, a two-way contract or something? Not at all. I mean, no, no, no. I mean, they were talking about, you know, my profile, they were interested, but it was a lot of players, you know, at the time, you know, like on the list. And it was already players who had like experiences, you know, as far as like NBA walkouts, you know, like a couple of teams knew them. And for me, it was my first experience. You know, I was like this, like this guy that no one knows, you know, except the fact that he's, he's a young Miami's cousin, you know what I mean? Then he played uh, in college, St. Mary's. That's about it. So I was... Uh, I was really taking everything as bonuses. You know, it was really like everything that they would have offered for me, it would have been bonuses. Like to the point that the experience that I had at the time with them was more human experience than a sports business experience. Like, you know, if I can, I don't know if you really understand. It was more like I was getting along with everybody. Yeah. I even got along with Mike and Finley, you know, back in the days, you know, and I remember him giving me some shoes and I was like, damn, Mike and Finley is giving me you know, some Jordans, you know, like custom made. I still got a pair. Like, matter of fact, I can go pick it up, you know, and I, I wore that pair maybe three times. You feel me? I was like, this is, I was like, this is money right there. I don't know one day them, them pair of shoes going to cost money. And I'm sure that if I put them on eBay today, yeah. I can get a nice check, but I won't do it. <laughs> <laughs> I won't do it. So you just got the, the way I look at things in, you know, in life and even at the time, even if it was no contract, it was just like all benefit. You know, I learned a lot. You learned a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Mm -hmm. And so just after uh, this amazing experience, you went back to, to France to play with yeah. uh, a lot of different, uh, different teams. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Can you explain why uh, you, you play with uh, that much teams and not just team? one or two or maybe three? Well, Honestly, if this, if uh, the sports system, you know, as far as basketball here in France was like in the States, when you can sign contract for four or five years, I would have stayed with like two or three teams in my career, you know, but the sports business in France is not the same, you know, and as you know, it's rare to find like a player, you know, is going to stay for like four years in the same team in France. It's always changes. And I don't really... I don't really like it. Why? Because I don't think that you can build a strong, you know, program and a strong project by switching like individuals every single season. If you look at all the teams, teams that won championship, I mean, like I'm talking about caliber championship team. If you look at it, they kept like a few players, you know, all together. And then they add over players, you know, to it. If you look at Real Madrid, if you look at Barcelona, if you look at even PSG, mm -hmm. you know, right now in France, they're going to keep like a strong, you know, like four or five players, you know what I mean? That's for soccer. And then they build around. Look, every team that won like the uh, the Champions League, if you look at the team, most of them won two or three already. Basketball is the same thing. Look at the EuroLeague. You look at CSKA Moscow, if you go to Maccabi Tel Aviv, if you look at Real Madrid, Barcelona, They kept all those players. And the reason why, you know, I play with so many teams is that, first of all, my first year when I played for Reims, I was aiming to play with a team who's going to give me a lot of playing time. Because you have to be able to be on the court for people to see you. If you pick the money over the playing time, you know, especially since I was like a, uh, I was an unknown player, even if I was French, because I spent five years in the States, People want to see you. So I choose to um, go to Reims because they were like, we're going to give you like a lot of playing times. And that's what I did. So I played about like 30 minutes a game. I had a great first season, which actually allowed me to ride right after that to send with Le Mans and to play uh, under Vincent Collet, to play in the EuroLeague after my second year being a, being a pro back. So to me, that was... That was great. You know, that was like, I was taking the ramp and I kept going up. I was like, okay, now that I'm here, what's next? What's above? You feel me? To actually try to go back to the States. 
So I did that. Uh, I played for Reims, uh, Reims uh, basket back in the day for one season. And then Le Mans, I signed for two years, but I only paid one year because I cut my contract after my second year. And I went to Orléans for two years. Then I got hurt. Then I stopped. Went back to the States. Then when I get back to when I got back to France, I played for Dijon, but only for two months because I replaced uh, I replaced the injured player. And I did the same thing, you know, because I only played for six months, you know, after I got back. So I played for two months for Dijon, and then I finished up the rest of the season with uh, Antibes, you know, and we stayed in Pro B. I actually scored a buzzer beater, and that buzzer beater pretty much uh, signed like the fact that the team would stay in Pro B, you know. So good experience, you know. After that, after uh, Antibes, where well, I played in Boulazac for two years, then Boulazac we went up to Pro A, you know, went to Pro A. Then I stopped for a year, went back to the to the US to get ready well, to prepare my, my, my life after basketball, because it's one thing, but yeah, but you have to get ready for that. And I came back to Boulezac, and no, I went to aix Moyen, which is in aix les bains which is like 30 minutes away from uh, from my born city, like 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 where I was raised. So I wanted to, I wanted to get close to my mom, you know, to my family to see. I wanted my friends to see me play. I wanted my family to see where, where I lived, you know, where I spent like my childhood. And then I went to Boulazac and I finished my career in, in, uh, in Bordeaux. So, yes, I moved the club, but uh, I only signed contract of two years, you know, every single time. That's pretty much the max that, that you can sign, sometimes three years. Mm. But it was good. It, it was a good run. Um, like you say, you always choose the basket than the money. And we saw that yeah. in the SCAA because you were paying in France. And when you came in the United States in NCAA, at, back at this time, you, you, you want nothing. What do you think that now the NCAA uh, accept that the player, you know, win money with the the sponsorship? Uh... I really think it's a good thing because I was talking about it last night with one of my mm. friends. Uh, well, I, I can really relate to that situation, and I'm happy that today athletes gonna get is gonna get paid, you know, for for the image. Because it happened to me when I was uh, in co in college. Uh, the fact that I was paid, you know, when I was in Limoges, I was in Espoir. I was still getting paid. It was a, mm -hmm. it, it was it wasn't like a a big salary, but we used to get money. I mean, like for living. So when I got to college, when I got to the uh, when I got to Saint Mary's College, I uh, I got suspended for six games. You know, like my senior my senior year. You know, that the third year that they gave me. I got suspended because I was getting paid prior to my, you know, to the to the day I came, like to the U.S. Mm. So I only played, I played less than 33 percent, you know, of the game of that season in Limoges. So I only get suspended for six for six uh, for six games. But I have other French uh, friends and players like Yakuba Diawara, who played in the NBA. He was playing for Pepperdine. He got uh, suspended for like half of the season, you know, because he played more games with Dijon at the time. So when I got to college, that was one thing. That was like the first, if I if I may say that, the first issue that I have with the fact that players were getting paid. Then the second issue that uh, that happened is that my, when I got to Saint Mary's, Gap, you know, like the brand, mm -hmm. like the closing brand, wanted wanted me to actually they want they wanted to use me as a model for one of their uh, marketing campaign. But they wanted to use me, they used my image as a basketball player. You know what I mean? So this, my school had to send the, the file to the NCAA. Gap I had to send a file to the NCAA and the NCAA decided that I couldn't do the job because Gap was about to use my image as a basketball player to make money. And so in the other hand, I was about to get paid As a basketball player, even though I wasn't playing, <laughs> but the image as a basketball player, so it was a violation against the NCAA, NCAA rules. And I was like, at the time, I was like, this is stupid. Why? Because, first of all, I was French, so I'm a foreign student. I have an F1 student visa, so I cannot work outside you know, campus. So if I want to work, I can only work on campus, at the football game, at the library, and everything. But 
in terms of opportunity, those type of opportunities can actually lead to something bigger, you know? So you're telling me no because they, they're going to use my image as a basketball player? But at the end of the day, it's not about the, the role of the NCA, merchandising, uh, you know, to sell like sweater, to sell, you know, like all kind of stuff with like the logo of the of the team. And now that one of your player can do something can, and they can see his face, you know, somewhere else, you don't want to. So that makes no sense, you know. And so nowadays, um, I really followed like, you know, the entire story about it. And when I saw the when I saw the decision, I was like, finally, because those players, you know, when I say those players, male and female, deserve to get rewarded for all the sacrifices that they're putting every day. You know what I mean? For the school, all the money that they're bringing to the school, because we're talking about billions, billions of dollars. You know what I mean? Coming into colleges and everything. But at the end of the day, you think about it, you're gonna play sports for four years. Let's say if after those four years, I mean, you don't play sports anymore because you get injured and everything. At least you know that during the, those four years, you actually put some money on the side and that's money that can also help you out to pay your bills, you know, like your school mm-hmm. bills, you know what I mean? Because some, some athletes don't have, you know, scholarship, you know what I mean? So I think it's a good deal. And at the end of the day, let's be honest the NCAA will always make way more money than what they're giving. So that's true. It's nothing. You know what I mean? I mean, to them, it's really nothing. They honestly not should gonna... pay the players. And... That's what I think. They could pay the players, actually. They, they could. They exactly. So they could pay the players, you know what I mean? And it's not going to change anything. Exactly. Uh, you know, because they're still going to sell uh, tickets for the game. They're still going to sell sweater. They can, they're still going to sell block notes. They're still going to send phone cases with the logo of the team, all this, you feel me? They're still going to send, like, drinks, all, everything, you know, every every week, every weekend, every game day. So, yeah, they can. They can, actually. But that's a good thing. I think it's a good thing. And uh, also, it's going to motivate more play, more athletes to do it. But also, at the same time, it's going to prepare all those athletes to understand what it takes. You know, when you're done with college, to be in a in a real workplace, even if you play sports, because they will learn how to manage that money. You know what I mean? And actually, how to take care of the image, so the image can bring them income. So, to me, it's a good thing. Yeah. Uh, so now we can move to uh, your after career, because you're not just a basketball player now. Yeah. Can, can you explain uh, what did you do uh, to prepare this after career? Well, first of all, like to prepare it, I think that uh, I've listened a lot to uh, to the old guys, you know, to the old, old players, you know, like we used to come in the locker room telling us stories. And when you're young, you're like, yeah, whatever. Yeah, oh, yeah, 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 whatever you're telling me, you're old, you know, time has changed and everything. Actually, time do change, but it's always a cycle, you know, things Things are repeating themselves over and over. You don't know when, but it's a repetition of things. And I had this conversation with Jan Bonato, you know, like back in Limoges, and Fred Vase, who's a close friend of mine. And they were telling me that, you know, don't think that right now you're playing basketball, but tomorrow it can, it can be over. Mm. You can get hurt and never come back from an injury. You can get fired, have a bad reputation, and never find a team. So what are you going to do then? Uh, I was like, well, I'm going to make some money. Yeah, but even if you got that money, when are you going to use it up? How are you going to get more money? I'm going to have to work. Exactly. So you need to so you need to think about a plan B. If basketball stops tomorrow, what are you going to do? So I've seen I've seen it all, and I've seen that Fred Fred Vest was invested. Was, he was investing in different things, and I was like, okay, that's smart, you know, and everything, but I still didn't under, understand, you know, at the time what it was. And when I was in the States, you know, in college, we used to have, like, you know, team dinners. And I remember we used to have, like, uh, all the families that give donation, you know, to the college so they can actually sponsor, you know, the, the scholarships. And I was like, okay, so these people 
are the reason why I'm here. And all they want is to meet us, take pictures, you know, shake hands and everything. And I was like, okay. And in the U.S., you have what they call the alumni, which is the equivalent here in, the, uh, I mean, in France of uh, uh, the, uh, the, old, the club of the old students, you know. And that's a network right there, you know, like if you ever need anything, you know, you can call up those old students and everything. And they do that a lot in the States, you know, it's a part of the culture. And I was like, damn. So you're telling me that when I'm done with college, if I ever need something or I need to find like a training or whatever, I can call. And they were like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's like, that's what it's here for. And that's how my mind changed. Because my agent was in the same mindset. And I was with him and I started meeting like big people. When I say big people, I'm talking about like Danny Nelson, Mark Cuban, you know, I was like, yeah, I'm just, I'm out here shaking hands with those people and they're just regular people just like me. They're cool, you know, we're talking, you know, there's nothing like, it's not like this, it's not this, I'm not going to say it's the same way you see them on TV, but, you know, TV and media always show you people the way they want you, want them, you know, uh, to show. And I was like, I got, I got their phone numbers, I can call them, you know, we talk about real things in life. So I was like, Fred, you need to build your network. You know what I mean? But build your network, build your network the right way. Don't build your network because you're expecting something from people. You know what I mean? Build your network because you because you're humble. You know, you mm. you just being yourself. You know, you're not selling like another character. And I start meeting people. You know, like like I said, big people, small people, and, and everything. And, and from like exchanging, you know, communicating, talking to people. I've learned so much, you know what I mean? And that helped me, you know, to, to put my mind in a certain set that I was like, okay, you playing basketball, but you can also get ready for after basketball. And if you want to do it, you got to do it right now because you, it's not when you're going to stop and you're going to be like looking at yourself and be like, Fred, mm, what am I going to do tomorrow? Uh, no, I don't want to do this. You ain't got no time for this. You know what I mean? Because... I would have been old, and when I look at it today, you know, I'm 29 years old. I starting, I started building my network back in uh, 2000, so it's been 20 years. And my first business, you know, that I got involved with was, I mean, is Illicit Producers, you know, like the movie production company that you know, that you heard of with Arnaud Beton, and that was 10, and that was almost 10 years ago. So. Today, I look at it. I stopped playing basketball five years ago. So if I would have had to do everything that I've, that I've done so far, ah, honestly, I wouldn't be talking to you today. I'd be like, you know what? I'm busy. I'm building my <laughs> you know? So, so this is exactly how I started it, thinking about business because I understood that I was evolving in a sports because I was a part of the sports business. So at the end of the day, I was getting paid. But I, I wasn't my own boss. I was an employee. So when you got people today, you know, like we live in this era when you, you hear a lot of things about athletes. A lot of athletes, uh, like companies are really interested of recruiting athletes and everything. There's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, similarities, you know, between the athletes' world and, and, uh, and, uh, and the business world. I'm like, at the end of the day, it's normal. The only thing is that no one ever told um, um, pro athletes that he was an employee. An employee works in a, inside a company. So he's already in a business, in, you know, like in a business mold. But he doesn't know it because he thinks that he's a superstar because he got a jersey on and people are clapping. People want his autograph and everything. But at the end of the day, you can get fired. If you don't do your job, you get fired. You know what I mean? So... The athletes is simply an employee in a different field of expertise, which is sports. And sports doesn't, the, you, you don't need like a computer, you know, when you play sports, you don't need the pen, you don't need like, but you do need skills. You know, you need to train. Just like, you know, just like a secretary, she needs okay, to get to, to, to know how to type fast, you know, how to dictate everything. If, if you find like a, a mechanic, a mechanic needs to learn how an engine works, how the car works. He's going to get underneath, you know, he got to work. The only thing is that athletes are, are tools. 
is simply our bodies. So we have to take care of our body. We have to eat right. You have to train. You have to go to the gym. You know what I mean? You got to pay attention to everything because if you got like if you have an injury, you're not going to be 100. percent If you got the doctor or surgeon who's ready, you know what I mean, like to operate. If he cuts his little finger, he's not going to be 100. percent So he's, he has to make sure that he's healthy. He has to make sure that then his mind is ready because he has to be focused on on another human body. You know what I mean? And do the job. If it, if if he doesn't do it right, and he made a mistake, he can get fired too. And an athlete is exactly the same thing. It's just the way that I think that the word we we're using words. You know, when we talk about athletes, it's like oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna say it in French. Oh, c'est un sportif. Oh, you know, it's like oh my God, it's it's, it's incredible. You know, you know what I mean? It's like oh, we love him to the point that even uh, Yannick Noah. And Ignoa was like the favorite, you know, of like the French people. I think he's still like, he's, he's, he's top three as an athlete because like the aura, you know, like the way they see him. But when you look at Yannick Noah, he never changed his mind. He's walking with no shoes. He did all his, all his concert with no socks. And no one, for real, he was like, but he was walking because he, uh, he's an entertainer. You know, he's an athlete and he's a singer and he's a dancer too. So... That world, you know, of heart and entertainment is really something that people really need to understand that is a part of the business world. That's it. You know, and we have skills, but we have skills because when you realize that you have to get ready for after your first career of sports that you're going to have to work. Well, in 10 years, I've learned the equivalent of what a regular guy you will learn in 20 years because I got no choice. I was playing 10 months out of the year. I have to perform for 10 months. If I don't do good, I'm not going to find a team. So I ain't got no time to stress and panic and be like, oh, damn, how am I going to do? I need, no, I, I never panicked. I was like, you know what, Fred? If you do the job, you're going to find a team. And we used to move from like team to team because that's our job because we love it. We love it. So... You know that now that I work, you know, I have another job and I go to work and sometimes some co-workers be stressing because they're like, oh my God, the client didn't send me this piece of paper. This is the end of the world. I'm like, you're really stressing because your client didn't send you that paper. All you got to do is grab your phone, call that client and tell him that I'm waiting for your paper. That's it. <sighs> you know? So, <laughs> exactly. But that's, I think that's the the advantage that we have is that when you're 17 or even 12, you know, for soccer and, and you play professional sports, you already, you are learning about the workplace. You just don't know it, hmm. but you are. And that will be all for today and come back for the last part of Ferry Kajiwanu story next week. He'll talk more about uh, what he've done since uh, he retired from being a professional basketball and all the challenge he has to Well, to manage every single day. So we are waiting for you next week. See you there. Bye-bye.